work with him yesterday is any indication we have a fantastic, fantastic CLA, and I would like him to introduce himself. Uh, my name is Kevin uh, uh, Petrie. I'm excited to work uh, for the Transportation Committee. I think we all use transportation in some sort of way, so I uh, am excited for the work that can be done. Excellent. It's kind of a, we're underrated that way as a committee. <laughs> people don't realize that every day we're doing something that impacts people's lives. Um, thank you very much and welcome. Uh, what we will do now is um, move the minutes. Um, actually, there is one. Well. I'll, I'll have Representative Petersburg make the small oral correction to the minutes. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, under the approval of the minutes on, on the minutes, uh, where it's true that Chair Hornstein did call on me to, to move the minutes, he did not actually move the minutes. I did. So that's the only correction. Otherwise, uh, Mr. Chair, with that correction, I move the minutes as correct. Thank you very <laughs> much. We think absolutely you move the minutes. Um, any discussion, members? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion prevails. Uh, members, we have one uh, item, one bill on our agenda today, and um, that is House File 195, and um, Representative Elkins is our um, author from the committee, and Representative Elkins, um, welcome, and I believe we'll have you move this as a committee member. Um, it's a layover We're going uh, to, motion. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll move that, uh, that this bill, House File 195, be laid over for potential including, inclusion in the Transportation Omnibus Finance Bill. Correct. It is a finance uh, item. And, um, and members, just to, to preface this, um, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to have a, a little bit of an extended uh, conversation about this bill, it's, it's not just a bill uh, discussion, but um, I think we're going to have a number of times, a uh, number of occasions this year, opportunities to talk about different transportation trends at this stage of the pandemic. And um, this has to do with commuting and telecommuting and transit. Um, and it's a very, very important topic. In fact, uh, uh, in 2021, we um, authorized a, a very comprehensive study of uh, commuting patterns. Uh, this is really going to impact a, a lot of our work. And so this is one. We'll have a few others, but um, this is kind of a preliminary conversation about that in the context of this bill. I um, heard a similar presentation that we're about to hear uh, last month in Eden Prairie, and, and I thought that this was the type of kind of not only bill hearing but overview that would be very beneficial for the entire committee. So I appreciate, Representative Elkins, your work on this, and uh, the floor is yours as well as your guests. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as Chair Hornstein said, uh, uh, he attended a lot of, of the uh, annual breakfast uh, legislative meeting of the 494 Corridor Commission uh, several weeks ago and was uh, very impressed with the uh, presentation that you're about to see. And so uh, while this particular bill uh, relates to uh, uh, the 494 or Corridor Commission and its uh, commuter services traffic management organization, we're likely to see um, similar requests from the other major traffic management organizations in the region as well. So I'm, I'm proud to have been uh, associated in one way or another uh, you know, with this uh, body for uh, over 20 years. I actually was the chair of the 494 Corridor Commission back in 2009 and 2010. They do amazing work. <coughs> uh, and uh, they've been doing work on tele, uh, telecommuting, teleworking uh, for a very long time, going back to when they did a, a pilot program called Results Only Work Environment at Best Buy probably 15 years ago. And uh, so uh, I think the, this organization is at this point the kind of the uh, premier organization in, in the region in, store in, in terms of understanding and being able to teach uh, employers uh, how to do uh, telework and how to do it productively. So I'm going to, um, without further ado, turn this over to uh, um, uh, our executive director, Melissa Madison. Also, we've got with us Rebecca Schack, who is the current chair of the commission, and Michelle Leonard uh, to my right, who will also be presenting this morning. And are we still working on the technology? So, the, okay, yeah, we, we're having a little technical uh, challenge here. Um, do we, do you want to just um, wait a minute or two for this to be fixed? Yeah, I think everybody has a copy of the presentation. Okay, well, why don't we, um, 
Do you want to start with Melissa then? Uh, Thank you so much. And then um, I think in, until we get corrected, uh, I would just uh, refer to this, uh, this handout, uh, I-494 Corridor Commission Strategies for Reducing Traffic Congestion. Mm -hmm. is, uh, I feel like a reading teacher. Uh, this and is the document that we're working with. Great. Proceed. Good, Welcome good morning. to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Hornstein and Representative Elkins for having us this morning. I'm Rebecca Shack. I'm a council member in the city of Minnetonka and I'm the uh, chair of the 494 Corridor Commission Board. Now, the 494 Corridor Commission was established under a joint powers agreement with the city of Minnetonka, Eden Prairie, Edina, Richfield and Bloomington with um, the, the, the Corridor Commission was formed in 1986. At that time, the goal, and it continues to be the goal, but the goal of the commission was to reduce congestion on 494. And as, as time has passed, while that goal has continued, I think how that's been accomplished has varied. Um, just a little context. So 19% of the metro area lives along uh, the corridor. 21% of the metro jobs are along the corridor. And that um, bears out in Minnetonka. We actually have more jobs in Minnetonka than we have residents. Um, the, the corridor has 313 plus thousand jobs uh, located along it, and that is more than uh, both downtown Minneapolis and downtown St. Paul combined. So while we, at, at our cities host the 494 corridor, and it certainly is a regional amenity, it serves, really serves the entire state. We were, in this day, day and age of technology, we're able to determine that on any given day, people from 85 out of 87 counties travel along the corridor. So not only is it a commercial hub, but it is the art, obviously the artery to the airport and the Mall of America. And so our goal in reducing congestion not only addresses um, uh, work commuters, but it also addresses people getting all around the world. So I, I don't have a lot more to say other than that our, our financial ask is really important to keep the organization afloat. The cities contribute. Um, we've received funds, state funds, and we also receive CMAC funding. There's an opportunity also for a federal match. So it's important that we have um, support here at the state level in order to meet that match. So I am going to introduce to you our executive director, Melissa Madison, who will give you a lot more information about the work that's being done. Thank you very much. And um, members, I, again, just to underscore, you know, some things we may take for granted, you know, issues around 494, but they have statewide significance. And particularly, um, I think we're going to hear how many what percentage of our constituents use this corridor. Of course, we all use it uh, to and from the airport, but a lot of other activities along this, the mall, et cetera. So welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Hornstein. I'm Melissa Madison, the Executive Director of the 494 Quarter Commission and its staff. Um, we are a program called Commuter Services, and uh, we're otherwise referred to as the 494 TMO. And um, a special thank you to um, Representative Elkins for your support and your leadership in leveraging the resources of the transportation management organizations to help the state meet its multimodal transportation goals. And good morning, members of the committee. So um, let's advance to the slide about the the study of commute behavior on 494. One more or two more. There we go. Oop. Thank you. So along the 494 corridor, 95% of the commuters drive alone for their commute to work. And 4% carpool, approximately 1% bicycle and take transit, 
And we learned through a study that the Corridor Commission conducted that 30% of the commuters are willing to try transit and 30% are open to carpooling. And um, so with that information, the Corridor Commission hired staff to go out and um, work to reach the commuters, to offer them resources to help them uh, find someone to carpool with and to tell them what transit would get them from where they live to where they work and offer free passes and an itinerary so they could give it a try. Um, so we have a staff of five. Um, we work through employers to reach the commuters um, with the primary goal to shift drive alone commuters into a sustainable mode. We work with approximately 1,200 employers in our five cities along 494. And uh, the metrics that we talk about really are um, contained to the five cities. And um, you could also think of it as the 494 strip. And next slide, please. So um, the 494 TMO is one of five metro area transportation management organizations. And there's an Anoka County TMO represented in yellow, and there is a, um, a downtown Minneapolis TMO called Move Minneapolis. There is a St. Paul TMO called Move Minnesota, and they were formerly known as Transit for Livable Communities, um, and then there's the 494 TMO represented in green. And then Metro Transit operates as a TMO for the remaining um, area of approximately 50 cities in the seven county metro area. And uh, as Chair, um, Chair Shack had mentioned, uh, the 494 Corridor Commission and the TMOs, we receive CMAC money, which is a federal grant to reduce congestion mitigation and improve air quality. And um, so there's a, a little breakdown of how the CMAC monies are allocated across the TMOs. We work through employers to reach commuters, and here's a, just a few pictures from commuter fairs that we help, um, that we hold. We do approximately 130, uh, between 100 and 130 on-site commuter fairs each year with employers and multi-tenant office buildings. And th those numbers are pre-pandemic, um, and we're working our way uh, back toward that now. And we have a, a number of resources to help employers with their employees commute. We provide displays with the transit routes that serve each employer, and um, the displays have other mode information. Uh, we also provide free outdoor bike racks to employers that don't have one or if they have more demand and need an additional rack. We provide preferential carpool parking as an incentive for uh, people who are willing to carpool, then they're able to park closer to the front door at their employer location. Um, we hold lunch and learns on site with employers, teaching people how to bike to work since biking for your commute is different than biking recreationally. You have to think more about your safety as you travel on roads with cars. Um, we also update um, employers and multi-tenant office buildings on major construction projects that are happening um, in our area. And um, we hold regular telework and hybrid work strategy related webinars. And um, then we have a, a robust set of resources to help individuals with their commute. We call our services the commute concierge. And uh, so we do ride matching to help people find someone to carpool with and uh, also to start or add people to a van pool. We do customized transit itineraries and provide people with two free passes so they can give it a try. We also have amazing bicycle commuting resources with um, different county bike maps and um, tips on how to bike in traffic as well as the Minnesota bike laws, and then a, a deep set of bike-related resources with um, different biking apps. 
And then um, one of the best kept secrets in the Twin Cities, I like to say, is the Guaranteed Ride Home Program, which is administered through the Metropolitan Council. It provides people who have signed up for it with um, $100 worth of taxi ride reimbursements in a year, or Uber, or Lyft, um, et cetera so that it provides a safety net for people who have chosen to do something other than driving alone for their commute in case, let's say, school calls to say that their child is sick, or maybe they need to work later than what the carpool um, typically runs, or they have to work later than the bus. So um, people just sign up for it before they need it. They have to be um, using an alternative to driving alone three or more days per week to qualify. And um, then we have robust resources for uh, teleworkers and hybrid workers as well. And so this is a, an abridged version of um, our services in a nutshell, but we have um, metrics. We measure each year how many people do we serve, and at the time that we help them, we ask them, what is your primary commute mode right now? And approximately 95% are driving alone at the time that we help them, and um, so we survey commuters on uh, every other month to find out, did you um, receive the information that we helped you with? Did you try it? If you tried it, how often are you now using the alternative to driving alone? And uh, so represented, represented on this slide are the metrics for the conversions into new transit riders, new car poolers, bicycle commuters, teleworkers, and new van poolers. In a typical year, we are able to convert just under 6,000 drive-alone commuters who switch to using a sustainable mode after our staff assists them. Um, um, next slide, please. And that results in an estimated 56 million vehicle miles avoided as a direct result of commuter services outreach. And that um, adds up to 56 million vehicle miles avoided is uh, just over 23,000 metric tons of CO2 emissions saved. And it would take the equivalent of um, over a million mature trees to reduce the same amount of CO2 emissions. I just want to get caught up on, here we go. And so those estimates are conservative based on um, just the people that we assist and the people who report back to us what they have tried and what they're now using on a regular basis. And um, it costs less than a penny for each vehicle mile avoided. Um, so we take our budget divided by 56 million vehicle miles and that's how we come up with it's less than a penny for each vehicle mile reduced. And the work that we do helps meet three of the main goals in the state's multimodal transportation plan. Uh, the first is to decrease annual greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector by 80% by the year 2040. Um, the second is reducing VMT across Minnesota by 14% per capita by the year 2040, and also increasing the percentage of people who bike or walk um, at least once per week on a regular basis by 2040. And so, next slide, please. So I also wanted to um, thank you, Chair Hornstein, for um, wanting us to present this information. Uh, the state had given us um, funding for creating telework resources and hybrid work resources, um, which we have done, and we created the brand Twin Cities Telework, um, which is available statewide, not exclusive to the Twin Cities. And um, let's look at the next slide here. So with the 300,000 telework appropriation, we created the uh, telework website, and we offer regular webinars um, on telework and hybrid uh, work arrangements. Um, and we have deep resources for employers, for managers of teleworkers and hybrid workers, as well as the teleworkers and hybrid workers themselves. And um, 
we survey, which you'll hear a little bit more from, uh, from Michelle in just a moment, that we survey employers on a quarterly basis to find out what are their telework and hybrid work arrangements. Currently, uh, through the pandemic, we were asking, when do you expect um, your employees to return to the work site? And uh, we learned through the surveying, employers were asking for training for training their managers on how to go from managing people who they could just walk around and have conversations with to managing in the remote work environment and how that's very different. You have to switch to a, a more challenging level of management style where you have to manage by deliverables and metrics and a communication has to be um, uh, robust um, both ways between the employee and the manager. So employers asked us for um, more training and ergonomic and home office recommendations and mental health tips for their employees who are working from home. And one of the things that um, both employers and teleworkers were asking for was information on, um, uh, there's an acronym for it, um, FOMO, the fear of missing out. So uh, people who worked from home <coughs> feared that they were missing out on fun things that were happening at the office. Um, and so we addressed that. Um, here's a, a resource that we use internally with our staff and um, heavily recommend a daily telework log where the employee would tell the, employee, the manager at the beginning of the day what they plan to work on. And at the end of the day, same, send the same report filled out indicating what they did actually accomplish. And um, in the past year, Twin Cities Telework has assisted over 300 employers statewide with telework and hybrid resources. And so we'll turn it over now to um, my colleague, Michelle Leonard, who is our Outreach and Programs Manager. Good morning. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Michelle Leonard. I am the Outreach and Programs Manager for Commuter Services. Um, since May of 2020, Commuter Services has conducted approximately one dozen commuter and employer surveys to track the impact of COVID-19 on telework and the subsequent commute or what wasn't a commute. Um, I'm going to specifically focus on 2020 because that's the year where we really started to see some of the shifting changes in the traffic patterns. So in 2020, we conducted two employer surveys, or I'm sorry, 2022. We con conducted two surveys. One was in March and the other one was in July. Um, in March, we asked employers of P, uh, employers whose staff were working from home to project their anticipated return to work site dates. Now, if you look at the chart that's on the left, you'll see that in March, about one third thought that they were bringing their staff back in April. Another one third didn't know yet, and about 22% had projected for a May or June return. And then the chart on the right is from July, where by that time, um, the return to work really had started to take, take hold. And we see that nearly three fourths of our employers said that their staff had already returned to the work site in at least one day a week, if not more. Now this slide has been kind of what I call the ebb and flow of telework and drive alone over the last two years, three years, or three years. Um, it kind of looks at um, from the very beginning of, of 2020 through last October. Now in our, in our commuter surveys, we routinely ask commuters what their primary mode of transportation or getting to work um, is three or more days a week. That's what we define as our primary mode. Um, we do survey them on all of our modes, but for the purpose of this chart, it's just the drive alone, which is in the green line, and the telework and hybrid, which is that yellow dotted line. 
Now, in the first survey, which was in May of 2020, only 7% of the respondents said that they were working from home three or more days a week before the pandemic began. And 57% said that they were driving alone. Now, when we look to May of 2020, drive alone trips had dropped to only 8% and the telework had skyrocketed to 78%. Now you'll see in the middle there, there's kind of some ups and downs there um, as between the drive alone. That is pretty indicative of when the different variants came. Um, the variants, of course, kind of pushed back or affected some of those return to work dates. But if we go all the way down to the end, in October of 2022, you see that the green drive alone line and the yellow dotted telework hybrid line have almost met. This is indicative of a decrease in people working from home and an increase in people commuting or driving alone to work. So now this chart kind of breaks out all of the commute modes that we asked about in October. And we now can really see where those two lines intersect. The telework and hybrid had approximately 35% of respondents said that they were teleworking still, but 34% had already started to drive alone. And you'll also see that we had 13% of our respondents who were bike commuting, 9% were taking transit, and only 2% were carpooling. Um, those are lower than we're used to seeing. But some of the reasons that we've been given by commuters is that uh, for many commuters, they had left the position they had three years ago and their pre-pandemic commute, sustainable commute, no longer works. Um, turnover has left some carpoolers without partners and some van poolers with not enough people to ride in their vans. Um, flexible scheduling for hybrid is affecting the dates and the times that people are going into work. So um, those hours that they're on site are often outside of a predetermined carpool or van pool time, so they're not able to ride with someone else. Um, and then transit routes. Many have been changed or eliminated, and the routes that exist um, are often long and cumbersome for riders. And frankly, the idea of public safety on transit has been an influence. Um, I apologize that yours is in black and white, so I hope you'll be able to see on the charts on the walls there. Um, this chart is a comparison between how many days per week commuters in May thought that they would be going to the work site and that's in blue, and then the yellow represents how many days commuters in October said they were going to the website. Now remember in May, the return to the work site was just beginning for many companies. And at the time, 24% of commuters surveyed said they thought that they would not be going to the work site at all during the week and 18% said that they expected to be at the work site all five days. Now by October, most organizations had already brought staff back to the work site, so when we look at those responses, it becomes evident that working from home is not as predominant as many thought that it would be. The number of commuters who were not going to the work site decreased by 13%, and the numbers who were going to the work site five days a week increased by 8%. <clears throat> and again in May, uh, with the blue columns, we also asked commuters to tell us what days of the week they expected to be going to the work site. So we could kind of determine what that daily commute might be looking like in the future. The majority said Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday would be the busiest days of the week. And this was true in October as well, when commuters were actually traveling. But this comparison revealed something that we really hadn't been looking for. 
and it was that there is a, there was a significant high, significantly higher number of commuters going to the work site in October than were projected in May. In fact, when you look at this, you'll see that October show for, to, from October's data, actual data against the projections, you'll see that there is anywhere from 11 to 19 percent more people commuting on every day of the week, work week. So this is um, this is just kind of a quick look at what our past surveys were. Um, we are in the process of preparing our next employer survey, which will go out in February, and we will do this higher level um, commuter survey follow up again in later this spring. Um, we are kind of anxious to see what the results will be because we know that many employers have really brought back their staff and um, some employers are pulling back on the number of days that people are um, working from home. So we're kind of expecting that um, our resources and services will be, there'll be an increased need for them. Um, copies of our survey reports are available upon request. And with that, I thank you, Mr. Chair, for this opportunity to present. Thank you so much. <coughs> and um, what we're going to do now is proceed to uh, members' questions. And, and I just want to just remind the committee, this is a, a crucial discussion uh, that we're not going to just have today. But ongoing, you know, MnDOT is monitoring traffic levels uh, and has data on that. Um, so we're going to hear from them in a couple weeks about that. Um, in Met Council's overview, I thought they did a pretty thorough job on ridership uh, trends. And, you know, we're going to continue to have that conversation. So, um, again, this is important as we look at the future of transportation uh, in whatever the new normal may be which I think is still evolving. So I, you know, you're, there's precious little data about this. And so you know, what you're providing us here, I think, is really important. So um, with that, I will start with Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the uh, testifiers, just a real quick question about the Twin Cities Telework website. Um, I know there's a significant amount of individuals who, over the last couple of years, they worked from home and they realize that that is a scenario that really, really worked for them. Um, does this website provide potential employees with a connection with employers who would provide them with that opportunity? So, uh, for example, in my district, I know people who regularly drive 100 miles to get to work every single day, five days a week, and they're just, just crying for some way to not have to do that. Um, does this website provide them with that connection of someone who they could potentially work from home five days a week? Thank you, Representative Wilson, for that question. At this time, the website does not um, indicate what employers are hiring teleworkers. But we've been asked that question before. Oh. And Representative Wilson, it's an excellent question, and I know you have a follow-up, but I, I wanted to fill in. You know, the U of M has done a lot of work on this um, even before the the pandemic, and, and they have a whole, I think Hennepin County is part of this too. I mean, there's a whole like list of employers that are engaged with this, and, um, and so we'll have them come in at some point too, but it's a good question and deserves some follow-up. Yeah, just to follow up, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd highly recommend that we start looking into that because seeing as this, this took our entire way of doing business up and it really worked for, I, I taught uh, during COVID and I found out that I am not good at working from home. I need to be in the workplace. Um, but there was a significant amount of students who they thrived online. And I think that we have a significant portion of individuals in this state who would greatly benefit from this opportunity. Thank you, Representative Wilson. Uh, next on the list, we have Representative Petersburg. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I do have just a few uh, kind of follow-up, uh, fill-in-the-gap type questions for, for those Please. of us that, that might need it. Uh, one is, if I remember right, uh, we have given funds to uh, this corridor management organization in the past. And I think Mr. Lee may have that information for us. Uh, but I think this bill will now make it an automatic, whereas the others were, were one at a time. Uh, what were those numbers, if Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee might have it? Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Petersburg, uh, the, this uh, TMO has gotten funding in fiscal 
2016 at 200,000, in fiscal 2018 at 150,000, fiscal 19 at 150,000, and fiscal 2022 at 300,000. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Represent Petersburg. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Lee, and I, and I believe this bill, um, as it is, would make that three hundred thousand a year permanent in, into into the future, uh, which may be per perfectly uh, appropriate. We'll, we'll see. The other question I have is in regards to the other TMOs. Do we know if uh, I don't remember any other uh, TMOs getting funding? Is is this the only one that's getting currently appropriated funds? If anybody knows? Yes, yeah, so we'll have our uh, our testifier and then if we could also have Mr. Lee if necessary. Thank you, thank you, Chair Hornstein and Representative Petersburg. Um, the other TMOs were funded along with for the 494 TMO the first year that we asked for funds from the state, which um, Mr. Lee, I believe that was 2016. And so um, the first set of funding, uh, it was a total of 200,000 that was shared amongst the three team, main TMOs, the 494 TMO, Minneapolis TMO, and St. Paul TMO. Representative Petersburg. Thank you, and I, I just have two more questions. No, uh, uh, one is, um, I know that your particular TMO was created through Joint Powers, and I think most of the others were as well. And so, and they were created a long time before uh, the need arose for this funding. Uh, what what has changed that would require uh, additional funding from the state for for a, a joint powers agreement that the count the uh, cities actually felt was important, and so they were funding it prior to this. So what has changed since then? That is a good question, and maybe Representative Elkins, you can help me out, but I can tell you that there was a change in the interpretation of the CMAC grant, where 20 years ago, um, the Twin Cities was flirting with air quality non-attainment for a while, and then we went into air quality maintenance mode, and during the maintenance mode, um, the CMAC was interpreted where um, administrative expenses were not to be covered at the same percentage, so um, things like rent and utilities, computers. Um, so the, um, the 494 TMO had to uh, come up with more, um, more funds to cover that, and so our, our local funds did not leverage as much um, toward uh, the work that we did. And as I recall, thank you for that. And as I recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, if if we were in non-attainment, that might have been something like a three hundred million dollar hit to the region. So you know, this is really a important preventative <laughs> mechanism. But did you want Representative Elkins to uh, real quick, former yeah. City Council member Elkins? To so I, I want to. I think the, when the the CMAC money started to to shrink as we came closer into attainment, I think as I recall, the cities did increase their dues. Yes. Yes. So it's a combination of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the CMAC funding is, is shrinking as we come closer to attainment. And then does it get much worse when we actually are in attainment for a period of years? Because we're in attainment right now, as I recall. Um, I'm not, a, I, I couldn't yeah. answer that specifically. I apologize. Yeah, I just, as our air gets cleaner perversely, we get more, uh, less and less money from the feds to uh, further clean up the air. And so the CMAC as a source has generally <laughs> been declining. Um, the city's dues into the organization have been uh, increasing. And I think the other uh, point I would make is that, uh, you know, as we were getting these one-time grants from, from us, um, the um, 494 was uh, standing up or scaling up these services. We now have uh, collected the data to demonstrate that it works at scale, and so we, we want to continue to fund uh, at, at scale a program that is working. Also, Mr. Chair and Representative Peterson, there are new federal funds that are available that require um, match, and that is under carbon reduction programming. Um, and so those funds are available retroactively to 22 and will go for a period of seven years. And so if we're able to receive funding from the state, we would be able to access the carbon reduction uh, funds to um, provide more of these services. And members, um, uh, I believe that Mr. Burris at one time, and maybe still has this, um, did a glossary of transportation terms. 
and I think it's good for um, <laughs> both uh, our newer members and returning members. Maybe we'll make this available. But just in case you're wondering about CMAC, yeah. that's Congestion Mitigation Air Quality. And uh, so that's uh, what's being referred to here, which is a, a federal program. Um, so uh, did you want to follow up, uh, Representative Petersburg? Yeah, yeah, if I just have, have one final question, and this is more probably more of a statement, Mr. Chair, if I could. And, and that is, um, with, with the funds now coming from the state in order to support a lot of the research and development that's going on there, and the fact that the other TMOs will have some at least similar uh, needs and, and acquisition, my hope is that at least that uh, the information of best practices and procedures and so forth will certainly be shared with the other TMOs around the state and that there's some sort of joint collaboration between them as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good point, and I think Representative Alkins would like to respond. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a very good point, uh, Representative Petersburg. And in fact, I do expect that uh, the uh, other TMOs in, in the region will be coming forward to uh, uh, adopt some of these practi best practices that have been developed by uh, by 494. And I would not be su at all surprised to see them, uh, you know, make a funding request to uh, start participating more actively in these programs as well. Thank you. Um, Representative Tapke is next. Vice Chair Tapke on, next on the list. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I've got a couple questions about the commuter data. Um, four things here. Um, when you have the, the return to work site slide um, that's anticipated work return to work site in July of 22, um, you've got 73% that have already returned there. And then um, in the October 22 commuting by mode, there's 35% that are working from home. And I'm just curious as to how like all your data is is matching up and how that is uh, uh, looking going forward. And then secondary question that you can answer at the same time is how does this compare and are you comparing it to other other TMOs, other regions? Like how is this an anomaly or is this something that's uh, seen across the board? Uh, Ms. Leonard. Thank you. Um, the difference between um, this slide, let me go back to my notes here. Um, the difference between this slide and the following is that um, this slide in the July section there with the return to work, that is the employers had told us that they had brought their staff back one or more days per week. So it's not necessarily a primary commute. It's that, that they may have people who are working from home one day a month, um, but they still brought them back to the work site. Whereas the other data that we're looking at from October of 2022, those were commuter results. And that was the commuters telling us, I am physically working from home three days a week, or I am physically driving alone to, to work three or more days per week. And then of course the rest kind of shakes out with the different modes that they've been using. Um, as to what are, um, if there's a regional comparison or anything, we have really been tracking the commute patterns along the 494 corridor um, since, you know, Mar well, since everything changed in March, 20 March 2020. Um, and uh, we have shared our information, our survey results. Um, we share them with our board members, of course, and we also share the reports with our sister TMOs. Um, and it's, it's kind of a practice when they do, uh, we're not really apples to apples, we're kind of the whole cornucopia <laughs> when it comes to um, our programs. So uh, the questions that were asked are, they're specific to our region. We share that information, of course, and the, the other TMOs, when they do their surveys, they share their, their results with us too. So we can just kind of get a broader picture of what's happening, but we're not necessarily married up. This is what's happening here. This is what's happening here. Uh, Vice Chair Tapke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that answer. I appreciate it. Um, and then this is a question for, I don't know if Representative Elkins wants to or the director. Um, this uh, funding comes from the general fund for this and the Transportation Advisory Board does competitive uh, work um, 
to award uh, funding through federal solicitation, regional solicitation for transportation <clears throat> management organizations. Why does this come through the general fund and not through that process? That's a good question. Did you want to speak to Representative first? Elkins? You can have, if you feel comfortable answering it. Okay. Okay. Thank Proceed. you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, so the competitive um, pot of money through TAB is uh, it requires <clears throat> local match. And so we're, we're seeking the local match um, to do the work that we do, which could not access the federal funds um, that are the competitive funds. Um, so the competitive funds are only federal and require the local match. I think the uh, Met Council funds this the the TMOs out of the non-competitive grant. Is it? I think they have a, a pool uh, out a of the, a set aside out of the uh, congestion mitigation and air quality pool of funds that they have that they um, do uh, distribute among all of the TM TMOs in the region. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vice Chair. Okay. Uh, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and I really appreciate the presentation and the data. I've got three questions. Um, first for, I believe, Ms. Madison. Um, I want to build on a question from Rep Representative Petersburg on the coordination between TMOs or sharing of best practices. Do you have any structure set up today where maybe you meet monthly or quarterly or, or something like that? Because I would think that there's a tremendous opportunity for that, and I'd love to hear if you do that. Thank you, Representative Krantz. Um, so in the in previous years, the TMO executive directors and um, outreach staff would meet on a monthly basis. And then that um, gradually turned into quarterly. And it is um, anticipated that we would meet um, with some frequency. And so I think that um, right now it's coordinated through Metro Transit who manages the CMAC grant allocations to the TMOs. And so, um, so I think that they're looking to bring us together more frequently than what has occurred. Representative Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would encourage that. Um, another question, uh, you know, the changes that you found when people started to mode shift, do you look at all about how sticky those are? You know, after, when someone makes a change, are they still doing it a year later or two years later? Do you have any sense of, of how that works? The and I, I, know, I know we have this kind of blip in the middle here with, with COVID that right. changed a lot, but I'm interested in what you saw before that. Um, Representative Krantz, um, well, we can tell you that on a, on a national level, when um, the, the, we're members of the National Association of Commuter Transportation, and they have studied how long uh, when someone makes a mode shift, how long do they stay with that alternative mode before they might go back to driving alone? And um, the national average is 80 months. Eight, eight zero? Eight zero. And Representative Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one final question. I think this one is from Ms. Leonard. And this is also on the, this chart that we have up here already. Um, my question was, is that this said that uh, in March, it looks like no one was back to work. And then in, in October, 70 some odd percent came back. Am I thinking about that right? Or was there some group that were already back that were excluded from the March? Data? Yes, yes. Um, this chart is specific to the, um, we pulled out the data from the, um, from the employers who we're utilizing telework or hybrid work. That is what this chart, the, both okay. this, this chart set actually is based off of those employers who had people working from home. Um, we routinely get um, 15 to the, the, the I, and I wish I had this in front of me right offhand, but I think we routinely get about 15 to 20% of our employers who said that they didn't utilize um, telework at all mm -hmm. during, the, during um, the last three years. And so that information, you know, that's not taken into account in this set of slides. This is specific only to those who had people working from home. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kraft. Uh, Representative Murphy. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is really about the uh, just thoughts on future surveys, uh, especially with regard to employers. In my district, um, the trend is going to where uh, employers are wanting their employees back to work. And they cite, uh, you know, issues like poor teamwork. Um, they cite issues like some employees are making up work for the work for others. And uh, just the treating all employers, uh, all employees the same. Um, so I'd really like to vet that out a little bit more. I think there's some definite opportunities for employers um, to, to uh, you know, to really get more from workers that, uh, you know, are uh, working from home. But those are some of the issues they face. So in a future survey, to have some of those. But I'd like to hear your thoughts and maybe what you're thinking with regard to employers. Thank you, Representative Proceed. Murphy. Um, so we, um, we hear the same things as we're hearing from employers who are responding um, that it has affected people's, um, it has affected teamwork, um, it has affected people's feeling of connection and loyalty to their employer um, it, once they move to a mostly remote environment for several years. Um, so, so we're responding with uh, resources for employers and managers on how to help their um, employees feel more connected and uh, with specific strategies on how to do that and um, resources for the teleworkers employers as well. So from both sides, what the teleworkers can do and what the managers and employers can do. May I add on to that? Um, we are currently, as I mentioned, currently preparing our next um, employer survey, which will go out next month. Um, and in that, with, with every major shift, um, we always review our questions. That, is this relevant to right now? Um, I suspect, if I'm remembering our questions correctly, we're going to see, uh, when we look at the anticipated work site, return to work site, we're actually rewording that to, um, you know, how much are, are you back at the work site? Is it, so we know exactly how many people or how many employers are already bringing their staff back. And um, we also ask them questions, bigger questions in the surveys about what kinds of, um, not only in what kinds of telework materials that we, that they would find helpful that or resources that we can develop and we work on in between, but we also ask them what sorts of commute resources are helpful for them to address the, um, the new or emerging needs of this new workforce as they come back in a hybrid, in a hybrid pattern. So um, we do really, we really look at both sides of the coin when we work with our, when we do our employer surveys, we're asking both that telework component and the, and what can we do to help you with your return to work commute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Sansamira. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for this presentation. I think it's bringing up a lot of really important things for our committee to think about. I think I'm wanting to dig a little bit more into return to work site and kind of how that's correlating with vehicle miles traveled. Um, you know, so as I see it, kind of there's there's three buckets right now in terms of employers. There's jobs that we know have to be done in person, right? So people that are back entirely full time in person, you know, jobs that can and will be entirely remote. I'm thinking about people I know that work for companies or organizations that are nationwide and there's no office and they're going to work 100 percent remote. And then I think we have a lot of people who are kind of in this hybrid place of trying to figure out and weigh different things, you know, based on employee preferences and employee retention, flexibility, but also, you know, some of the challenges that we've talked about of managing a team and managing work when, when you're um, hybrid. And as employers are making that decision, I, I'm wondering kind of how you as an organization or, you know, can incentivize and work around thinking about vehicle miles traveled. So, you know, you all talked about some of your survey data that shows that the car, car pooling is less. Um, in this kind of world of hybrid work, partly because people have different schedules, you know, and I'm thinking of organizations or companies I know that are really trying to give employees a lot of flexibility of saying like, you don't have set hours in the office, but if a meeting needs to be done in person, come in for two hours on a Wednesday, and maybe there's an all staff training and you're gonna come in for one hour on a Friday. 
you know, do you think that that um, there should be ways that we are incentivizing people to kind of match up schedules so that there is more opportunity to carpool? I guess, alternatively, would some people want to keep the schedules flexible so that there's less congestion, right? Because if everyone is carpooling on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., that's going to um, build up to congestion. So maybe people want that flexibility. And is there a way to capture, you know, even if people aren't carpooling, if they're only coming in, if each employee is only coming in one day a week, that's actually saving the same vehicle miles traveled. So uh, yeah, kind of how are you all thinking about that? Are there ways to kind of just work with organizations to capture overall vehicle miles traveled and incentivize ways to um, to lessen that if carpooling makes sense? Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Proceed. Chair. Thank you, Representative Sensamara. Um, amazing question. <laughs> so um, we encourage employers to offer a robust um, set <clears throat> of commuter programs because um, what a person chooses to do for their commute is um, really an individual decision based on what their family needs or their personal needs are. And um, so when an employer can offer a robust set of commuting resources like a transit pass or that they pay for um, or heavily discount um, is a great incentive as well as um, offering the preferential carpool parking and subsidizing van pools so that when employees are coming on site, they have options to do something other than driving alone. And so a good percentage of our work is um, helping employers set up those commuter programs. And um, we have amazing examples of Twin Cities employers that offer um, a deep set of resources um, or commuter programs and what that means for then how many van pools do they have with how many riders, how many carpoolers, how many people are using the transit passes three or more days per week. Um, and so so that is um, offering incentives. Also, um, we do through an individual basis with commuters where we um, every month have a try it campaign where if um, people are willing to pledge on their honor that they will do something other than driving alone, we enter them into a prize drawing for a nice prize such as a, um, um, an electric bike. And um, some of our prizes have been um, a $100 Visa gift card, for example. So um, does that... Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank, thank you so much. That's really helpful. And I guess maybe my question is more, you know, for our committee to think about, like, you know, I think you're talking a lot about individual incentives for employees, right? About, like, if you try this other mode, you know, we'll support you and stuff. I guess I'm trying to think about incentives for employers to kind of think about as they're weighing all the different reasons that they might bring someone to the office first, might not, to kind of incentivize them to think about vehicle miles traveled and say, you know, yes, there's a benefit maybe to having people in the office all together all the time, but um, there's also a benefit to not having people drive 100 miles just to come to the office. And so, I don't know, is that something that we can think about? We're putting, cons uh, thank you, sorry. Um, Representative Hawkins. <clears throat> okay, yes. One of, the, one of the things that uh, Melissa's organization has done is work with the, the member cities in the 494 Corridor Commission and uh, I think is it Bloomington and Eden Prairie have adopted yes. Minnetonka as well, probably a tra traffic demand management ordinances um, that uh, when a, a new employer wants to significantly expand, require them to basically reach out to Melissa's organization and put together um, demand management programs that offer this whole um, suite of services that commuter services offers. So there is definitely con a concerted uh, um, uh, outreach to employers as well. So, um, uh, and including like the 494 office complex, at 494 and 100 the, uh, Normandale Lakes. Um, they work with the uh, the management of the whole office complex on on these kinds of educational employer uh, programs for all of the employers uh, in in the in the complex and like the Mall of America. Yes. Yeah. So, there's a lot of employer outreach. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, 
one of the things I just wanted to mention is I think our organization as a board member and not a, a staff member um, that is remarkable to me is the ability to meet the moment. I think we've shown over the past three years as we've gotten data from our surveys, conversations with our highly engaged employers, that as things start to percolate up, our staff has been very nimble in being able to help provide supports for those things. So development of the hybrid policies and the telework policies are a good example of that. And I think as commuter um, patterns change and what employers are expecting out of employees and how we can meld these things to serve three purposes, right? Meet what employees and employers need, uh, mitigate congestion on 494 or in, throughout the state really. And then also we've, we're doing all this with this environmental sustainability lens and how can, as we get this data and information, can we develop policies and supports to get those, meet those three objectives. Representative Brand. Uh, Mr. Chair, just a question. Uh, you had said that we're gonna have MnDOT come in and is, is it specifically on I-94 or? No, um, thank you. Um, uh, Representative Brand, my understanding, and I, we do, I did see Mr. Dean and others. Um, I think you're uh, collecting data statewide or just in the metro area, statewide? Okay, so they'll be coming in in a few weeks um, with some statewide uh, data uh, on changing commuter patterns over these last several years. So um, we'll be looking forward to that presentation. I have some specific questions about the I-94 or 494 corridor. So yes. maybe I should just direct them to Mr. Rodin. Yes, and um, maybe uh, our testifiers today might uh, have some insights if it's about, four, did you say 494 or 94? 494. Well, I mean, maybe try try them out now if you want, and we obviously can no, talk to Mendon. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll okay. send for Mendon. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, are there any other committee questions? I have one, but I wanted to wait till uh, everyone else had a chance. Um, thank you for the presentations. Um, and, and again, because we're looking at this statewide, and I think that this corridor has statewide significance. Um, can you um, share with us, you know, the, to the extent that you have it, you know, who would be the like top five or among the, you know, highest employer? Uh, you know, entities along the corridor. You know, I'm thinking about the airport. I'm thinking about Best Buy. Um, you have all these different hotels and office complexes. Um, what are the sort of the top ones uh, so that, you know, can give our committee and, and others who are following this uh, some context? Because, again, I, I was struck by the uh, slide you had that, that, that you're right up there with the downtowns. And so who, who are the major employers uh, all along the corridor, just very specifically? Okay, very, very good question. Thank you, Representative. Uh, thank you, Chair Hornstein. Um, well, you did mention the airport, which is extremely significant um, as far as the number of employees they- Oh, you got the mall. I forgot about the, the mall. The Mall of America, <laughs> yes. Um, Best Buy, Cargill, Optum, um, and we've got uh, 5,000 people at Normandale Lake Office Park um, and uh, Medica um, Health Partners. Thank you, U.S. Bank. Pretty significant, so just to give folks some, some context to what's out there. Um, and just, you know, by way of conclusion, um, you know, I, I noted, um, uh, Council Member Madison, uh, I thought you put it very well um, in your comment uh, about commuter patterns changing. And just to, to highlight this, um, you you talked about you know training employers, getting employers you know ready for you know these changes, and you know particularly with telecommuting. Um, uh, you talked about mitigating congestion, which I think everyone feels along this particular corridor especially. And then the, you know, the environmental and, and climate issues associated with this. So I think those three are, are critical. And when you talk about um, you know, preparing employers, I, I was struck by you know, one of the things you mentioned, um, employers asking for mental health tips for teleworkers. I, you know, this is just something that really was so 
a parent uh, during the height of the pandemic and, and continues to reverberate. Um, and, you know, this is an interesting, I, I think the, the mental health crisis really impacts work in so many of our committees, you know, whether it's public safety or education, obviously healthcare, but there is a piece of it that affects us and, and our committee and the constituents. And I think particularly on the teleworkers piece so that, that um, you know, we we're kind of looking at the nexus between that and transportation, I thought was really uh, interesting and important in this presentation. So members, I want to thank all, all the members, thank all of you and, and thank the members who were so engaged with this um, today. Uh, I, I think there's few issues that we, you know, really need to deal with as important as, uh, you know, how we address transportation in, you know, in the, whatever that new normal may be, and we still don't know. Uh, but we're, you know, constantly evolving towards it. And I thought this presentation was really helpful in putting some context to some future conversations that we're going to have. So with that, I uh, want to give the last word to our author, Representative Elkins, and then we will... Yeah, thank you, Mr. Over. Chair. I think um, what we've heard this morning is that, uh, you know, when, when the pandemic first came along, there was this mad scramble to, to set up telework environments uh, so people could work remotely. But early on, it was how do I uh, get a Zoom account and how do I set up a virtual private network? Now we're seeing employers transitioning into, okay, it looks like hybrid work is going to be with us to stay. How do we do it well? And I think this organization has uh, positioned it very well uh, to be able to pr provide employers with the assistance on how do I do this well, since it looks like it's going to be a permanent part of, of, of our environment, an important part of our, our overall strategy to reduce vehicle miles traveled. So. Um, I you know, applaud, uh, applaud the uh, Melissa and her team for the good work they're doing, the pioneering work that they're uh, doing that I think will serve as a, a template for the other TMOs uh, around, the, around the state as well. And thank you for bringing mm -hmm. you know, House File 195 to our attention, and thank you for the presentations. Uh, with that, members, we will lay over House File 195 for possible inclusion in an omnibus transportation finance bill. Thank you. So members, um, that concludes our hearing. I did promise some comp time uh, from our <laughs> long hearing the other day, so we'll get some amount of that. Um, on Thursday, we have a couple of bills uh, coming up. Uh, Representative Hansen ha has a bill on um, living snow fences and, and habitat highways uh, that we'll be hearing. And then also a bill that I'm gonna be bringing which uh, brings together a number of agreements we had with the Senate last year in our conference committee. Um, Representative Petersburg was on that committee. We actually voted those, uh, all these provisions, uh, but that bill never, um, you know, was, uh, we never had a conference committee report on transportation. So, you know, these are policy initiatives. There is some fiscal implication. There's a small fiscal note for the bill. Uh, but we do want to move that one out so that, uh, you know, that was work that was done last year. So let's kind of get that going and clear our plate a little bit for other initiatives. So that's coming up on Thursday. And then we have a number of bills next week. Uh, but our focus is now on Thursday. And uh, with that, our meeting is adjourned.